Hello, this is Tim DeSmet. I'm a process development coordinator at the Broad Institute. I've been working on the Illumina process for the past two years. Today we'll be going over the Broad Institute's best practices for the cluster generation process, including a couple steps that aren't part of the standard Illumina protocol. First, here's the basic overview of our version of the cluster generation portion of the process. Following library construction, we use qPCR to quantify a sample. Once we know the library's concentration, we continue with cluster amplification, where we load the sample onto a flow cell. We then perform a CyberGreen QC step to verify that clusters were generated successfully on the flow cell. If the flow cell looks good, we continue with linearization and blocking and primer annealing, also known as LBPA, which completes the flow cell's preparation for sequencing. Really, we haven't changed much of the overall cluster generation process. This slide illustrates where exactly in the process our QC steps are taking place. Notice that we've separated LBPA from hybridization and amplification so that we can ensure a proper number of clusters have been generated with a post-amplification QC step. Today, I'll be going over a couple of key points in the cluster generation process. First, I'll discuss our qPCR process and how we have utilized this to obtain optimal cluster densities. Then, we'll move on to our process control samples, covering what samples we use as controls and why we have chosen that to use them. I will then go over our CyberQC step and review some of our recommended best practices. Quantitative PCR, or qPCR, is used to quantify the concentration of amplifiable library fragments. The result can then be used to optimize cluster density on a flow cell without requiring a titration flow cell for every library. Here is a quick overview of how qPCR works. Basically, fluorescence is detected at each cycle of PCR. As the amount of DNA increases, so does the fluorescence. Control samples with known concentrations are amplified alongside the experimental library, allowing you to determine the library's concentration by comparing its fluorescence to the fluorescence of the control sample. There are two main types of qPCR, TACMAN probe chemistry and cybergreen dye chemistry. We have found that the cybergreen dye chemistry is a simple workflow and works very well with our libraries and the qPCR instrument we use. qPCR can accurately quantify library fragments, especially when the qPCR process is automated. Knowing the concentration of a sample makes it much easier to produce consistent cluster counts on our flow cells. Here's an experiment where 96 indexed libraries were quantified individually by three different methods, normalized based on these quants, and then pooled together, with the goal of having equal amounts of library in each pool. We loaded each of the three pools onto a flow cell and determined the number of clusters with each of the 96 indices. First, the libraries were normalized and pooled based on the quants given by the Agilent Bioanalyzer. This was almost like loading the libraries blindly onto a flow cell. As we expected, the cluster counts were low and very inconsistent. We then used a Pico Green assay for quantification. This produced cluster counts that were much higher. However, there was a lot of inconsistency. This isn't too surprising because Pico Green quantifies all DNA fragments in the sample not just the fragments that are going to amplify on the flow cell. Finally, we used our automated qPCR quant result to pool the libraries. This method gave us some of the most consistent results. There were a few outliers, but overall, the number of clusters coming from each library was very consistent. Like I said before, our qPCR assay is designed to quantify only the amplifiable library fragments. We've done this by using P5 and P7 primers in our qPCR master mix to mimic cluster amplification on the flow cell. The only fragments that get amplified are double-stranded with both the P5 and P7 adapters attached. These are the only fragments that will amplify on the flow cell and they're the only ones that will amplify in qPCR. Using a high-quality set of standards is critical to the accuracy of qPCR. Ideally, we would use a different set of standards for each different library size, but this isn't really feasible in our high throughput situation with so many different sample types and sizes. Instead, our main standard is a synthetic monotemplate from Kappa, 
We can calculate the concentration of our samples by using a size ratio of standard size to library size. We recommend this standard, but we did have some success using Phi X from Illumina. Basically, the most important factor is to use a well-characterized library as a standard. The CAPA Library Quantification Kit is a qPCR-based assay that was specifically designed for quanting Illumina libraries. Since we determine our quants based on a size ratio, we can run a large variety of samples on one qPCR plate. Using these CAPA standards and automating our qPCR process has significantly reduced our flow cell rework. Typically, when we QC flow cells after cluster AMP, which I'll get back to later, we'll fail any flow cell when three or more lanes have unsatisfactory cluster densities. The graph on the right illustrates the flow cell rework rate over a period of six months at the end of 2009. Prior to November 2009, we weren't using CAPA standards, and the rework was very inconsistent. We identified multiple issues causing this inconsistency, one of the major issues being our qPCR standards, and one of which was pipetting variability. After implementing the CAPA standard and automating our production process, flow cell rework significantly improved, remaining below 20%, and we were able to significantly increase our throughput of cluster amps from 25 flow cells per week to over 80 per week. Quanting our samples with automation and CAPA standards decreased the variability in cluster density. The graph on the right illustrates the average clusters per tile of libraries quanted with and without CAPA standards. The target density was 200,000 clusters per tile plus or minus 15% using 1.5 RTA. Everything prior to CAPA standard implementation was all over the place, and since its implementation, we have increased our ability to hit target cluster densities, which has allowed us to easily adjust as newer versions of RTA roll into production with different target densities. We have also had success quanting low-yielding libraries. One example of this was back in early January when we were unable to quant a sample using Pico Green because the sample was at such a low concentration. With qPCR, we were able to detect amplifiable DNA fragments, and from these quants, we were able to successfully load and sequence the sample. Maintaining an in-house stock of high-quality, consistent standards requires a huge QC effort, especially at large scale. We've had great success using synthetic commercial standards, which we highly recommend due to their consistency and the fact that someone else performs the QC on them. If you don't want to use commercial standards, you can use an in-house set, such as a well-characterized Phi-X 174 library. When using in-house standards, we recommend making them and doing the serial dilution in large batches and storing aliquots at minus 80. We also recommend that each new batch is tested against the previous batch to ensure accuracy and reproducibility. Here on the right, we see a typical qPCR plot. We keep an eye on three basic aspects. First, we verify that the sample produces an enrichment curve. This is labeled A in the graphic. We want the enrichment curve to be flat for at least four cycles of PCR, then increase and then plateau. Second, we look at the threshold, labeled B in the graphic. This is an automatically generated line, which should be above the background and below the plateau. Third, we look at the no template control curves, the negative control, labeled C. These negative control wells typically display a low level of enrichment, mostly due to primer dimers and their amplification should occur at least 10 cycles after the experimental samples. One nice thing about the qPCR assay is that it requires very low amounts of DNA in order to be successful. This can, however, cause the assay to blow out the quant if your sample is too concentrated. We avoid the blowout issue by diluting each sample to around 10 nanomolar based on the rough quant produced by the Agilent Bioanalyzer during library size QC. We also run each sample in triplicate. If you do not want to dilute the whole sample, you can perform a serial dilution and qPCR quant all of them. Some of the dilutions should give good results and you can just ignore the blowouts. Here are a couple of other highly recommended best practices to ensure the accuracy of the qPCR assay. First, make certain that all the reagents being used in the qPCR assay are thoroughly vortex mixed. This includes the sample, the master mix, and the final reaction tubes or plates. Also, make sure that the assay setup is kept as uniform as possible. 
I highly recommend using an automated deck, even at low throughput, simply because it's so repeatable. However, if this isn't possible, I would recommend that you designate a single QPCR user so that the operator-operator variability can be eliminated. Next, I want to discuss some of the flow cell control samples that we add at cluster amplification and how we can use them to detect variations in the process. We currently use two types of control samples, determined by the other samples being sequenced on the flow cell. When we run base bias samples on a flow cell, we typically run a PHIX in lane 4. PHIX is a well-characterized small genome that is about 50% GC, and since it is a regular library, it follows the same workflow as any other sample being loaded onto the flow cell. We also use a set of novel internal controls, or ICs, on all of our flow cells. We add a small amount of internal control sample into every lane, along with the experimental library. On most of our flow cells, we skip the PHIX control lane using the internal controls instead. The ICs only use about 1% of the flow cell area, as opposed to using the entire lane. Internal controls are four synthetic monotemplate sequences that can be easily identified using our internal pipeline software. Internal controls provide us with a complete view of the flow cell. Since they are in every lane, we can use them to identify sequencing errors on a lane-by-lane -lane basis, something that is more difficult or even impossible when the only control is the PHIX lane. Internal controls have a fairly simple design. They are a pool of four monotemplate sequences that don't align to any genome, so they are easy to pull out from the sample in analysis. And since they are subject to the identical chemistry, imaging, and base calling conditions as the experimental sample in that lane, we can use them to determine what's going on with the sample itself. Together, the four different sequences cover every base at every cycle. In other words, at each cycle, one of the IC reads G, one of them reads T, one reads C, and one A. The internal controls are synthesized and cloned into a plasmid, then clonally amplified in E. coli cells. Flanked by unique restriction sites, the IC fragment, complete with final adapter sequence, is amplified using cellular reproduction, which is much less prone to errors than PCR enrichment. Each of the four ICs is cultured separately, and then the fragments are digested and purified from the plasmids. These preps are then quantified using qPCR and pooled equal molarly to ensure even base representation at every cycle. We'll cover a bit more about these internal controls in the Analyzing Data module. I am now going to go over our CyberGreen QC and how we use it to visually confirm cluster generation and optimal density prior to continuing on to LBPA and sequencing. CyberGreen is a fluorescent dye that intercalates into double-stranded DNA. Following cluster AMP, we run dilute CyberGreen dye through the flow cell where it intercalates into double-stranded cluster molecules. We then visualize the clusters using a standard microscope at 40x magnification. On the right, there is an example of an image as seen through the microscope. Our CyberQC step is basically a visual confirmation of successful cluster amplification. We use it to verify that clusters are present on a flow cell, and often to actually estimate the cluster counts. This is especially useful for projects that require targeting a specific density. When a flow cell is too sparse, you lose a lot of very valuable real estate. This is one of the reasons we value the fact that our qPCR assay is such a good predictor of cluster counts. The other side of it is that when a flow cell is too dense, there are a lot of analysis issues. RTA can become very sluggish in identifying clusters, and frequently the downstream data are lower quality than they would be if the cluster density was lower. A very dense flow cell can sometimes take weeks to finish analysis. Following Cyber, we've determined that a flow cell can be safely stored for at least one month before it continues through LBPA and sequencing without having any downstream analysis issues. This is an example of our Cyber contact sheet. We basically compare what we see on the flow cell to these images to estimate our cluster counts. At lower densities, it's pretty easy to distinguish differences in cluster counts, even down to variations of only a few thousand clusters per tile. As RTA becomes more robust and able to distinguish clusters at higher densities, it gets a little more difficult to accurately estimate cluster counts. But with more experience and a trained eye, we've been able to keep up with the continuing RTA improvements. 
This slide illustrates some of those density difficulties we encountered after switching to RTA version 1.6. The graph on the right comes from early January and plots cluster densities first percent PF reads. Initially, our new target density window was between 200,000 and 375,000 clusters per tile. However, even with such a large target, only 68% of our production lanes were hitting this density, with many of them being way too dense. By incorporating the QPCR-related changes I talked about earlier, and using those quants and historical data along with our CyberQC, we have been able to hone in our target densities so that roughly 80% of our clusters fall within 300,000 and 360,000 clusters per tile, with very few lanes being too dense. The last step in cluster generation is LBPA, which prepares the clusters for sequencing. We use pretty much the exact same workflow for this step as in the standard Illumina protocol. Following LBPA, we immediately load the flow cell onto the sequencer. Let's review a few of the critical points in our cluster generation workflow. First, utilizing high quality standards is critical to ensure optimal qPCR results. Using qPCR is a very reliable method of quantifying the amount of library required to hit target cluster densities. Secondly, there's more than one type of control sample to use for process control and downstream troubleshooting. We use internal controls in every lane and only use a PHIX lane for occasional flow cells with base bias samples or unknown novel samples. Third, using a CyberQC is a great way to verify successful cluster AMP and is a simple way to estimate cluster counts on the flow cell. I want to cover one last thing on the topic of cluster densities. This is an experiment that illustrates the effects of pipetting small volumes. It was performed by Niall Gormley at Illumina and controlled for variation introduced at each phase between library prep and cluster generation by splitting a sample at various points and continuing with duplicates in parallel. Basically, it shows that the more small volume pipetting steps a sample encounters, the more unpredictable its final result will be. The experimental design is fairly simple and used five flow cells. For the first flow cell, a single genomic library was normalized, denatured, diluted, and loaded into all eight lanes. This dilution was also loaded onto four lanes on each of the other flow cells as a control. For the second flow cell, four lanes, as I said, were the same dilution as on flow cell one. The other lanes took the same denaturation as was used for flow cell one, but diluted four separate times, attempting to perform exactly the same dilution four times. These each went into separate lanes on the second flow cell. These are the blue lanes. For the third flow cell, the same normalization that was used for flow cell one and two was used, but denatured four separate times, then diluted the same way as flow cell one and two, but separately, then loaded as shown in green. The fourth flow cell used the same enriched library, but used replicate normalizations, denatures, and dilutions as shown in orange. Similarly, the fifth flow cell took four completely separate libraries made from the same source DNA. These were all normalized, denatured, and diluted separately, and then run alongside the same lane dilutions as on flow cell one through four. Here are the results showing the cluster counts by lane for each of the five flow cells. Notice that the original dilution in gray, which is loaded onto every flow cell, gives consistent cluster counts among not only the lanes on a single flow cell, but across all five flow cells. The other color lanes show much greater variation overall. It's pretty clear that introducing variation earlier in the process can affect your cluster counts. Automating most of this process has helped us to alleviate the effects of small volume pipetting and user variability. From qPCR to strip tube generation, everything in our process is automated. We also store denatured libraries for reuse in case we need to create more data for a sample without introducing the variation seen in replicates. Other lab practices, which will be seen in the lab module, include ensuring that cluster stations undergo routine decon washes at least once per week. We will also show our reagent tracking system and how to verify proper flow on the cluster station. Here's what you'll see in the cluster generation lab module.
These cover some of our recommended best practices as well as a bit more information on our qPCR and cyber QC steps.